for your awards consideration, Barry, the HBO original series nominated for three SAG awards, including outstanding performance by an ensemble in a comedy series. Don't miss what critics call one of TV's best thrill rides. Barry is now streaming on HBO Max. Welcome to In the Envelope, a podcast from Backstage, the one-stop shop for actors and creators both above and below the line. I am your host, Vinny Mancuso, Backstage Senior Editor and Professional Entertainment Obsessive. I'll be your guide through every corner of the creative industry with the help of some of your favorite stars. Here you'll find intimate, in-depth talks with today's most award-worthy names in film, television, and theater. Along the way, we'll get advice on living your best creative life, relatable stories of the highest highs and lowest lows, and maybe, just maybe, a rare peak in the envelope. I really liken my acting to like how Dave Grohl talks about music. Like you can be classically trained or you can just suck and then get good. I don't think I ever sucked, sucked, but I definitely wasn't where I am now. I think it's like trial and error and you just absorb and you do. I think what I lack in craft and sort of performance intellect, I had in recklessness and fearlessness. Welcome to In the Envelope, the actor's podcast. I am your host, as always, Vinny Mancuso, uh, senior editor at Backstage, and I am coming to you right in the middle of the 2023 awards season. Uh, We are past the Globes, past Critics' Choice, the BAFTA nominations are out there, the Oscar nominations, the SAG nominations, uh, and one of the most pleasantly surprising names in that entire jumbled mix uh, is our guest today, Paul Walter Hauser. At this point, uh, Paul has a Golden Globes win, a Critics' Choice win, and a SAG nomination for his performance in Apple TV Plus's Blackbird, uh, which is one of the most purely unnerving serial killer performances and series since uh, Fincher's Mindhunter, easily. Uh, Paul plays real-life criminal Larry Hall, and uh, you know, spoilers for Blackbird, but he's, he's not a very good guy. Paul's performance is incredible, though. Uh, the the voice he adopted, this weird, calm, it's it's just all very, very extremely effectively unsettling. Paul himself is not unsettling. He's the complete opposite. He's a, he's a great guy, a humble actor with a ton of open, candid, honest insights into his career. Uh, we also happened to catch him right in between a screening and a pitch meeting he was heading to. So uh, this episode is quite literally a look into the life of a very busy working actor on the rise. Uh, Let's get right into it. Here is Paul Walter Hauser. How are you doing today? Where 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 are you right now? I mean, I mean, you're in a few places, but uh, where are you currently? I am. (laughs) I am currently in a uh, like a health food store in Beverly Hills. I just left a screening for my new movie. Nice. It's me, Sweeney. It's called National Anthem. I'm super duper proud of how it turned out. And uh, and I got a meeting at Imagine Entertainment to pitch some movie this afternoon. So I'm, I'm squeezing our hangout session between. I hope Very that's nice. okay. No, of course. Uh, this is definitely one of the more unique setups I've ever had. But I love, you know, uh, we like to give people an idea of what their life <laughs> The life of a working actor is like, and I think there's no better example <laughs> of, you know, you're going you from know a what? to a meeting. That's uh, that's the deal. Not every day is like this. This just happens to be one of those very L.A. sort of days for me. Uh, I'm missing my son's doctor appointment this afternoon for the purposes of the pitch. I'm a, I'm a little bummed about it. I'll see him this evening. Absolutely. So yeah, I mean, I I, I want to start just by saying uh, congratulations on the this this very busy award season for you. We have a, a Golden Globe win, a Critics Choice win, uh, SAG now. How are we how are we feeling about award season right now? I mean, uh, is has it been surreal? Has it been uh, you know a bit hard to comprehend in the moment? How how are you feeling from you know sort of taking a bird's eye view of it? 
Yeah, no, I think the bird's eye view, well, to get a little insular or uh, uh, invasive with me, I would say, you know, I, I, I'm a fan of award season just as a bystander, as a movie watcher, TV watcher. Like, um, I was never that into sports, not like most men are. And, uh, and so for me, this was like my sport was watching actors and actresses and following projects. So I, I really enjoy this time of year and a lot of great things come out this time of year. I think what has been very surreal is the receptivity of the industry to our series and my performance that, that has been very encouraging. And, uh, and, you know, I, I'm just happy to go to these parties, you know, eat, eat some free <laughs> salmon and shrimp and uh, rub elbows with my heroes. But to win a Golden Globe and a Critics Choice has been very uh, overwhelming. And then, you know, we have the the, the SAG nomination. I do want to ask about that specifically. And um, I, I'm just curious if that one, you know, if that feels different at all, because, you know, that is that's an actor's award, you know, that's, that's being voted on by actors. Does that, does that have come with any other sort of extra juice to it? Just cause you know, that's those, that's coming from, from your peers. Yeah, no, that's, I mean, that's the most overwhelming part about any of it. If uh, there's no other award from the Oscars to the Tonys to, you know, if I, if I was nominated for, you know, or given some key body Mark Twain thing to me, the SAG awards are like the awards because of who votes on them. And, mm-hmm. and I was so touched that they included me and Taryn because uh, we worked so hard on this show, man. We, we really put the work in. Absolutely. So I, I, I honestly can't wait to talk about Blackbird. Um, it is, it is one of the most effective performance I've ever seen. Uh, I was just sort of running through clips before this, and it's a very unsettling way to uh, spend an afternoon. And that is down to your <laughs> performance. Um, but I do also want to, you know, before we get into it, sort of back up and get, an idea of how you got here um and that starts with the beginning so i am curious you know do you have any sort of uh you know acting origin story anything that you saw at a young age a performance a movie anything where you're like wow that's uh not only is that acting but that's something i'd like to do like you know wh- where the where the yeah. love of craft came from yeah absolutely man like like i i loved comedy early on uh i i have a tattoo that has all my childhood comedy heroes on my arm and it's uh it's chris farley and daniel stern robin williams jim carrey martin short and uh jim varney so oh, yeah. uh, co- comedy was like the the beginning that was very influential but it wasn't until i i think within the same year and a half i saw nicholson in as good as it gets mm-hmm. and i saw him in uh uh, a few good men and i was like 12 years old 13 years old and i was like wow this guy is a whole new ball game mm-hmm. he's still funny like the guys i love but he's also menacing and uh and he's dramatic and even when you hate him you kind of feel for him so that was my first inkling that there's something there's something else to this acting game um and then i think when i saw daniel day lewis in gangs of new york in mm-hmm. theaters back in 02 or something that was a big moment for me because i was like nicholson's good but who the hell is this guy <laughs> yeah like this guy isn't chewing up a single thing and when he does it's only because it's appropriate and i i went back and i remember buying dvd copies of daniel day lewis movies i hadn't even seen mm-hmm. i just went to blockbuster and bought ballad of jack and rose i go to best buy i buy the boxer in my left foot like i just absorbed daniel day lewis and then phil hoffman and those became the guys where i'm like okay jack phil robert duvall daniel day lewis whatever the hell they're doing i would love to try to attempt that while doing common Mm -hmm. i'm curious you know and this is something I, i i get a lot of different answers to you know as you progress through your career you know as you move from step to step success to success um, how does your relationship to those to those North Stars change? You know, you you have these early inspirations. Um, how do you see them differently? The more that you knowledge you pick up, and the more that you you the more successes that come to you. Um, I don't know that I see them differently in the sense of it hasn't uh, put it this way. It hasn't it hasn't really changed my fanship or my opinion of them. Mm-hmm. But what is very interesting to denote. <clears throat> 
is this idea now that I can see I can see some of the process because I know it from doing it. Mm-hmm. Not because I see them acting. I'm not saying I see false notes. That would not be what I'm what I'm saying right now. But I, I do see the process and I go, Oh, he does a similar thing in this other movie. Oh, they do like there's a bit of nuance repetition or, or just sort of things that they lean into and it it actually gives me great uh great peace about my own performances because I, I I tend to be very judgmental of the things I do. Not that I can't watch them. I watch everything I do, but I I do see things that I wish were different or better or just not me in the character. And uh, and then I go back and watch all these other guys, and I'm like, you know, maybe outside of Daniel Day Lewis, every other actor does that to some extent. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I I've, I've always felt that sometimes seeing seeing the strings makes things more sometimes makes it more impressive you know i think that that seeing the process of what into it is like wow so you know i it, it's not it's not and like you said it's i'm not saying there are false notes but seeing and understanding how someone did something actually makes it more impressive to me a thousand percent i love those moments of improv those like brave moments from actors like it doesn't even have to be a big moment there's there's that line from Tommy Lee Jones in The Fugitive, which I believe he won Best Supporting Actor for. Mm-hmm. And he says, you know, Harrison Ford in the tunnel says, I didn't kill my wife. Tommy Lee Jones says, I don't care. Yeah. Such a weirdly profound and honest little moment. And those those little moments are always indicative of greater truths about the character and the circumstance. Absolutely. So as you're, as you're sort of, you know, getting more interested and involved with the, the craft and everything. Where, where are you um, picking up what would be considered technical skills? You know, how, how, how did you go about um, building whatever you would call your process or the things you do or the things you do from role to role? Where are you picking these things up from? I really liken my acting to like how Dave Grohl talks about music. Like you can be classically trained or you can just suck and then get good. Like, I don't think I ever sucked, sucked, but I definitely wasn't uh, uh, to where I am now. I think it's like trial and error and you just absorb and you do. I think what I what I lacked in craft and sort of performance intellect, I, I had in um, in sort of uh, uh, recklessness and um, and fearlessness kind of like Chris Farley just throwing himself onto the second city stage. Mm -hmm. Um, That, that was kind of my mentality early on. And I think there's a lot of habits I had to break little things like, you know, if you can't, if the tears aren't coming, uh, don't, don't try. Um, Or, or how about, should you even be crying in this scene? Even if it says it on the page, is this overkill? Is, Is this inappropriate? Am I, taking something from the scene by trying to give myself something. A lot of it is just that interrelational um, dialogue you have with the material. And that over time, if you, if you sharpen it and if you're self-aware and you give a shit, um, it gets better. But I don't, I don't have a process really. I just, I kind of make it up as I go. Absolutely. I am curious um, to that end, you know, and you mentioned, you know, recognizing should i be crying in the scene or should i do this should i not do this do you have a barometer as to you know when something's not working uh or is it just sort of innate you know you know you know that this isn't this is something to throw away or this is something to let go of not really and and that's scary for me because there have been moments that i thought i kind of you know i was like oh man i sucked ass this is horrible what what am i doing and then I watch the movie or the show, and that's like one of the best scenes. Mm-hmm. Uh, or there are moments that I think I nailed, and I'm like, "Oh man, that's my that's my scene." Blah blah blah. And then I watch it, and I'm <laughs> like, "Buddy, you are trying so hard. This is so embarrassing. Next time, uh, check your ego at the door and use your brain a little bit." <laughs> yeah, like I mean, there, uh, there's there's both versions of that, you know. And I think a lot of that. I mean. I, I think not a lot of it, but part of it is that trust you kind of have to have in uh, 
the creative team as well you know uh, you kind of have to, it's there's that innate thing about acting where you're like to let go of some stuff you kind of have to be like well i'm trusting you to make me not look stupid you know i'm trusting you to to, to a thousand sure. percent yeah a thousand percent i had this conversation a few days ago um i was doing one of the sag screening things and Topher grace and colleen camp were kind enough to host this little uh screening we had for blackbird and i i walked up to Topher because he and i he and I got along real well and we worked on Black Klansman together for mm-hmm. Spike. And I said to him, I go, man, I got to be honest with you. There were so many times when we were filming Black Klansman where I was looking around like, is this movie not going to be good? <laughs> <laughs> not, not because, not because I thought, you know, and I'm sure someone will pick up this, you know, phrasing and, and make a whole headline about yeah. Paul Hauser doubt, uh, <laughs> thought Black Klansman was going to suck. They always do that shit. But, you know, really, I just mean it, it's such a wild movie mm-hmm. from Jump Street at its inception, at its log line. It's crazy. It totally, it's you, very, it's a tightrope, basically. Yeah. It, it does. Yeah. And you, you, you got me trying to play specific and, and a little broad, but still grounded. And then you got Topher Grace dressed as the head of the KKK. It's just like, it, when we were shooting that, I would be lying if I said I knew that was going to be a great movie. And then I watched it and I'm like, holy crap, I'm so proud to be in this movie. Yeah, absolutely. So in terms of, you know, um, these early parts of your career and, you know, basically just anything before Blackbird, is there is there a specific uh, project performance, any of the things that sort of solidified for you what you wanted acting to be for you? Is there something where you're like, oh, you know, this is this is what I want this to be. This is what I want this to feel like. Yeah, I think uh, I did this show called Kingdom for DirecTV back in like 2014 to 2016. I think I shot like 24 or 25 episodes. And uh, it felt like an indie film, but it was television. So we had all this time to like draw out storylines and try different things and my character was kind of a wanderer where I eventually got little moments with the entire cast or at least most of them. Mm -hmm. And um, that meant a lot to me because it was intimate. And I proved myself to the degree that for the most part, they let me really make, make some bold choices. Uh, I Tanya was the first time where I was like, Oh, I think I'm in a movie that my manager at the time, this guy, Joel Zadak, he, he had a really good point. He made when I, closed my deal and went off to shoot he goes i think the town is gonna watch this movie Mm -hmm. um and that's important because as much as i want everyone to watch it and enjoy it or have some sort of box office achievement the reality is i'm always looking for my next job and every every job is kind of an audition for the future so the fact that folks in hollywood really embraced i tanya Mm-hmm. And so I was kind of doing my John Goodman, Big Lebowski type thing. Mm-hmm. You know, that that meant the world to me. And that, that experience making that film was really precious. Everybody was, even the most successful person on that set, they were still cloaked in this humility and this belief that they were lucky to be there. Mm-hmm. And uh, And that's, to me, that's important. Humility is so weirdly important to making good movies and TV. Um, and, and, you know, we all have to check ourselves at the door sometimes and make sure we're our heart or our mouth is right. But, but my experience is the best things I worked on from Richard Jewell to Cruella, I, Tanya, Blackbird, Black Klansman, uh, Cobra Kai, even like mm-hmm. humility, man, everybody's lucky, lucky and happy to be there. And, and uh, there's no hierarchical awkwardness. For your awards consideration, Euphoria, the HBO original series nominated for Outstanding Performance by a Female Actor in a Drama Series. Don't miss what critics call bold and original. Euphoria is now streaming on HBO Max. You know, I want to get to Blackbird because... Uh, that's what we're here to talk about and it is a truly truly tremendous performance um honestly uh it is it is it's it's transformative which i think uh unsettles people because i i think the the 
the key to this performance is how much people are drawn into your character mm. with all the evidence that he is uh just one of the worst people alive you know it's 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 the it's like it's, it's like you said it's it's that thing so i want to i want to go about first you know creating it from top to bottom and i guess the best place to start is with the voice because you did adopt a sort of very distinctive higher voice um did you work with someone on that uh is that something that came from the material um and how did you how did you land on where it where it ended um thanks for the those compliments man i i am so glad it affected you and you and you felt like you could get lost in the guy a little bit that's also you know i part of me is just like am i doing too many interviews am i doing am i putting myself out there too much on instagram like mm-hmm. I wonder if I'm overexposing myself and if it's going to be very unremarkable to watch me in anything in the next couple of years. Um, because I'm, I'm kind of giving a lot of it away in the in pulling back the curtain, mm-hmm. but, uh, but hopefully not, man, I like disappearing into stuff. It's, just, it's so important to me to disappear into things as much as possible mm-hmm. without being, without being ridiculous. You know, this method acting stuff where it's like, I can't eat the lettuce from catering because it's not <laughs> it's from the right period. region. Yeah. It's just like, I, I appreciate it. I get it. But like, you also have to know when you're being ridiculous, mm-hmm. um, let the character be ridiculous. Not you, the person, um, all of that preamble is to say, I building this character, a huge part of it was the emotional connection I had to have to him. Cause I got to humanize him. If I just look at him, like, a kidnapping, murdering rapist, I'm, I'm not even going to want to do the project. Mm-hmm. So I kind of have to put that to the side, not delete it, but omit it and put it in the peripheral while I focus on things I can connect to, like loneliness, feeling socially marginalized, um, feeling uh, misshapen or ugly, um, having aspects of your childhood that you wish were different, whatever it is. And then after I build that foundation, as I've been telling people in these interviews, I've been saying, you know, that's the foundation, that's the structure. And then the voice and the body language and stuff that that's kind of making up the, um, the walls and the ceiling and and we're, and we're dressing the house up a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I think the the voice was super important because this character, you got to commit. I heard the audio of the real guy, 10, 12 seconds of audio I found on YouTube. I think it's from a deposition, but that audio, I tried to mimic it. Mm -hmm. I didn't work with anybody. The only time I've worked with a vocal coach was on, was on Cruella because I wanted to get the Cockney accent as close Mm -hmm. to real as possible. The other stuff, I just kind of fudge it as if I was hosting SNL and trying to do a celebrity impression. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, no, I, I tried to sound like the guy. I got pretty close, though. I the register got a little high, um, unconsciously <laughs> throughout the series. I had some help uh, help tracing the voice of Dennis Lehane throughout the process because it's a lot to take on. You're you're, I'm having I do what I I call uh, sort of layering layered thought, I guess, mm-hmm. mental multitask. Where in a scene. It's not just about the scene. I'm ha- I'm thinking about five things at once, uh, and and that can be really great and and sort of produce cool results. And it can also be really hard to pull off. And if you don't pull it off, I feel like people can see audiences are really smart nowadays. So I had to do a lot of mental multitasking. Where I think there were moments in the show where I'm thinking the following. Um, this food, this prison food tastes really good. I actually like it and I'm enjoying it. I feel like I'm at home slash I'm kind of attracted to Jimmy Keen a little bit. I'm not, I'm not gay, but I'm attracted to him and there's something alluring about him. And I hope I can become alluring to him. Uh, slash I'm thinking about, um, wanting to tell him a story about how I killed this woman, but I don't want to interrupt his story. Slash like, all those thoughts are going in a blender mm-hmm. and you don't know how they're going to come out, but if you're present, they usually come out good. And, and I think if the audience notices me doing these weird ticks or sort of inhabiting like a jazz, like facial 
expression. It, it, it's because of the layered thoughts. Yeah. I'm curious. And if this is, if, if the answer is, I don't know, that's totally fine. But at, at, at what point do those, you know, do those conscious thoughts, those things you're thinking about become unconscious and sort of go away while still being there? If that makes sense. Um, they do and they don't. It depends on the take because I'll do takes where I have forgotten it and I'm just trying to inhabit and you're trying to let it go. Mm -hmm. But sometimes those are the takes that you don't like because you're being present isn't present if you're not in the character's mindset. Mm -hmm. So where does the actor start and where does the character begin, et cetera, at all? I, I just kind of look at it like, um, the more I complicate it, the better it usually is. Mm -hmm. Because if I under, no, there are times where you under complicate. If, if I'm in a Nancy Myers film and I'm playing Meryl Streep's, you know, uh, son, who's in seven scenes in and out, you know, doing a shtick, I'm not going to be layering my thoughts that much. I'm probably yeah. owning into some small piece of reality and just trying to keep up with Meryl. But a character like this, it's like, dude, you better layer that shit. I, I think if I did a war movie or something, you have to have layered thought in that scenario because you're thinking, I'm underslept, I'm cold. My socks feel like they're drenched in blood and mud. I miss this person in my life. Does this feel like I'm disconnecting from the world and having like disassociative disorder? Mm -hmm. uh, am I in pain? Um, do I even believe in the cause I'm fighting for? What is the wind chill factor? So like, there, there are times where it calls for it, and clearly, I thought Larry Hall and Blackbird called for some layered thought. Absolutely. Um, I want to ask about a few specific moments, just to sort of uh, dive a little deeper into everything you've said already. That's it's all these fascinating things, but Man, I want to see how they put I, into practice. I hope I don't sound like a dick, where I'm like, <laughs> like I'm trying to do some James Lipton stuff right now. I just no. need to, once again, I have no empirical sort of wisdom this is just how i do it you know what i mean no i mean i look the whole point of these conversations is to learn um how extremely extremely different literally every actor's process is you know i think the idea right. of a process is is just a way to it's just a phrase to have but i don't i don't believe in a uh a spreadsheet you can do to get a good performance i love hearing right the extreme range of things <laughs> that people do and whether it's nothing or it's more than any other person has ever done. So this stuff is fascinating to me. Um, and me to our too. listeners, trust me. me too. Um, but I do want to ask about, to start off, this. This uh, there's a moment, there's a scene in episode five of Blackbird, um, which I'm sure has been brought up to you a lot because it is one of the standout moments of the show, is this confession moment. Um, he's talking about the little girl turning it like a tourniquet. Um sure. I, I want to know, you know, sort of what the what that's like on set, you know, when you when you're sitting down in that chair and you're in the, the jail set and, and and Taryn is across from you, you know, like what is what is the moment before cut? What's the moment after cut? How are you getting to that sort of perfectly calm, disturbing place? Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> by the time we shot that. We had already shot four episodes, right? So I had about three and a half months of Larry Hall under my belt. Mm -hmm. I had settled into the character. I did feel the feelings and think the thoughts and say the things. So uh, that was kind of built in. Had we shot that the first week, it would not be what you saw. It mm -hmm. just wouldn't be as good. It can't be. How the fuck could it? Um. Sorry, I keep swearing. I don't know if people do that on the show. Totally. Uh, we'll, we'll figure it I'll out. Try to, I'll try to pull it back a little bit. Um, but yeah, no, the uh, the scene really was, I was in, dialed in. I knew that the stakes were high. Anytime the stakes are high, you over plan and over prepare anyway. Mm -hmm. So to, to make sure it doesn't suck. But, but, you know, I really looked at it like this character is finding some catharsis. I'm not going to tell this to my therapist. I'm not going to tell this to uh, a lot of people. I'm not mm -hmm. going to tell it to my brother. But I'm going to tell it to him. And telling it to him, this guy I'm trying to almost impress and relate to mm -hmm. on an emotional level, 
there, there's, there's a lot of wanting to live it out in the hands, live it out in the pauses. I am recreating it in my mind. And then hopefully the body language is just me helping tell the story. Mm-hmm. So I simplify it to telling a story. I know the emotional component of why he's telling it, how he's telling it, what he thinks of Jimmy, what he hopes Jimmy responds with. And, um, and you know, I think his looks where he's kind of like trying to keep it together, but he wants to cry or kill me, mm-hmm. which was done brilliantly by Taryn Edgerton for goodness sake. That's some of the best nonverbal acting that's ever been done in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, I put that up there with Brian Cranston playing Walter White and Breaking Bad. There are those moments where he says nothing and you're just like, oh, dude, you're everything. inside. They're twisted looking yeah. at him. Um, but, you know, I think as Larry, I look at Jimmy in that moment and I don't see fear or anger. I see he's listening to me. He's invested. He's he's learning. Uh, hey, do you want to go grab a notebook and a pen and write some of this stuff down? I mean, mm-hmm. To me, it's a moment of weird uh, brotherly tutelage. You know? Absolutely. Uh, I've seen you say, um, you know, in a few other interviews about the show, um, sp- specifically talking about Taryn, uh, you know, wanting to... to to get to a place where you were keeping him on his toes, you know, and it, there was moments of, of, of improv and moments where you were sort of having that, that, that making him feel uncomfortable within the, the boundaries of the, of the scene. I'm curious, you know, ha- tell me about getting to that place with your scene partner where, you know, you both feel comfortable enough with each other to sort of go beyond the, the material, go beyond anything to sort of just keep each other uh, on each other's toes to, to, to make things feel a little bit more truthful. I think it's all about context. So if we're in episode two, three, and it's a low stakes scene, I'm not going to poke and prod them Mm -hmm. unless it's absolutely necessary. In those moments, though, especially episode six, you have to poke and prod. If you don't, then you're just doing what's on the page and they can get anybody to do that. I think the, the key is to find your own things, find your own way in. Now, it doesn't always have to be this bombastic, uh, anthemic move on the actor's part. It can be far more subtle or or silent. But, you know, I, I in that moment where I'm beating my inner thighs with my fists, mm-hmm. simulating this warped version of a child's view on sex, uh, I, I improvise the line, I've dug more than you've effed. Yeah. And... Uh, that line, I, I said that because I felt it in character and I felt that he was trying to prove his masculinity. Because mm-hmm. Jimmy's masculinity, you don't you don't need to know a thing about him. You just got to look at him. And in that moment, I'm kind of like, you have your resume of women you've been with? Guess how many I've killed? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that's terrifying. God, is that scary. And to make it arrogant and cocky and and uh, aggressive in that moment, I thought that was appropriate. That and I think it's been said a million times in interviews now, but I just did a thing where I stuck my fingers in his mouth on take three or something. Uh, Cause I was like, dude, this has got to, we got to spice this up. We already got two safe takes. You know? mm-hmm. I'm curious how important that is to you. Um, and I've heard uh, this is important to a lot of, by the way, by the way, don't forget your question. I just want to note real quick. DiCaprio sliced his hand. Mm-hmm in Django Unchained and then just smeared his real life blood all over Kerry Washington's face. Absolutely. I I don't know that I for sure would have done that in the moment, but I like the idea of taking it, running with it, and knowing that even if your ankle hurts, you're trying to you're trying to score a touchdown, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sort of like that mentality. You know, and it's until you hear the whistle blow. <laughs> you got you have to keep mm-hmm. playing. One hundred um what i was gonna ask is is because you mentioned you know you had those safe takes and it was time to sort of take it to a next level um how important is it to you to have that 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 sense of uh we've got we've got something in the can now let's do a take to play and how and and what you sort of how you view that let's do a take to play um yeah, I don't even, it's hard for me to talk about it because I don't want to steer people wrong. I feel like younger actors could hear this and be like, I'm going to do whatever I want. <laughs> it's like, yeah. 
that's that's that. not totally what it is. Also, I'm like a, I don't know. It, 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 I, I'll give a good example. It's about knowing what what you're doing and who who likes what. So, when Nisha Ganatra directed me in Late Night with Emma Thompson and Minnie Kaling, mm-hmm. we have a scene where we're supposed to be rushing back to our chairs and working because Emma Thompson's coming back into the building, mm-hmm. and we all we're all afraid of her. So we had like one or two takes where we do it. And I'm like, dude, there needs to be something else here. And it's not because I'm the director. It's just because I'm instinctually like, this doesn't feel funny enough to me in my head. So I just told, without telling Nisha Ganatra, I just told the camera operator, I go, hey, when I come back in, I'm going to do a pratfall. So make sure you capture it. I don't know if you want to tilt down or, or pan a certain way but know that I will be falling out of frame or falling down and then quickly getting back up and still doing it there. So take three or four, I did that. Nisha ran in the room with the producers and Howard and Mindy, and they're like, are you okay? And I was like, yeah, no, it's fine. I did that on purpose. They're like, do you mind doing it again? It was really <laughs> funny. And then we did, I did like three in a row or whatever. Um, I'm always trying to find those things because why would you not if you care about the movie and you have an idea that could be good? Mm-hmm. Now, if you're doing it out of some egocentric, look at me, uh, my parents never watched me on the swing type of mentality, that's that's a whole other thing. But if you just love storytelling and you have an instinct and an idea that could be good, you should lean into that. Mm-hmm. Why would you not? Well, you're shortchanging your performance. You're shortchanging the entire film. And for all you know, what whatever you say or do in that scene could be a gift to your scene partner, and then your scene partner gets a better moment. Absolutely. Uh, you yeah. have you you have worked with uh, a a pretty impressive array of directors already in your career. You know, the Clint Eastwood, Spike Lee, up to the, these these incredible. Is there a um a piece of direction that's stuck with you from from that's that's sort of been you know it went beyond just direction? You're like, oh, that's that's something that'll stick with me. Hmm. Um, I, uh, I I think I can be very pace sucking sometimes. Uh, uh, clear, clearly not on purpose, but just as a force of unconscious habit. I was shooting Richard Jewell, and Clint would always tell me, "Same, but a little bit tighter." Or he'd say, uh, "Clint would say, skip to my Lou, a little more skip to my Lou," and I would be like, "Okay, okay." Um, but you know the people. PTA on the set of Magnolia, there's behind the scenes footage of him with, with Phil Hoffman. And he's like, here's how a normal person looks at a picture on a stand. And then he walks up, takes five seconds to kind of grab it, look at it and set it down. He goes, here's Phil. And then he takes like, you know, 20, 30, 40 seconds uh-huh. to do the exact same thing. And I, I think I suffer from that th- same thing of kind of uh, magnifying performances uh, or stretching them in moments that clearly don't call for it. But then again, sometimes they do. Mm-hmm. And then you end up seeing it in the in the movie, and they keep it in the edit, and you go, well, I can't totally ignore that instinct either. Yeah, it's so, that delicate balance uh, that it all comes back to, really. You know, it's 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 trust. It's, it's I, I, again, the answers to these questions change depending on the, the, the role, the project, the anything. And it's that's that's what makes these conversations so interesting. I, I got to tell you another good one. I did the movie Super Troopers 2 um, because I loved the first movie and those guys have been really kind to me and really sweet, the Broken Lizard guys. So I did this bit in the film and I, I, I kept trying to kind of ham it up. Mm-hmm. Um, and in my head, I recollected Farva from the first movie and was like, oh, I'm doing it just like Kevin Efferton. I was actually overdoing it and it was kind of like a mad TV SNL interpretation of something. And uh, by take three or four, Jay Shander Seacar was like, less sauce, less sauce. And I was so deeply like wounded and embarrassed in that moment because mm-hmm. I so like those guys. I like Jay and I want to impress him and please those dudes. But uh, I was like, man, I'm overdoing it. I look like a fucking idiot. And, uh, and so, you know, I, and so anyway, I point being less sauce has been a very helpful thing for me throughout my career. Um, and so has this, this guy, Greg Poppin, not a director, but 
this guy Greg Poppin that I worked with in the kind of TV producer uh, reality docu realm. Mm-hmm. He once told me the best wow. advice he ever was given was he was ever given was stay in your department. Don't don't reach, you know, don't. And 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 now the only time I really reach is if I think an idea is truly killer and I have mm-hmm. to say it or if there's like a continuity error and somebody lays down a bowl of cereal and there's no milk, I always speak up for continuity, but, but I try to stay in my department. Cause it's like, dude, nobody paid you to be a producer. Nobody yeah. paid you to be the writer. Nobody, pay, you know, I love that. So as we, you know, as we sort of wrap up here, I do have just, you know, one, one just general looking forward question, you know, cause Blackbird, it, it, it's such a, award season isn't over and you know, this, uh, we, you're still discussing this role, but as you look forward, has the experience of making Blackbird and you know what you've gotten out of it um, sort of changed how you go forward in any way? Are you are you has it has it given you any other view of acting or 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 are you still sort of keeping on as usual? I think I've learned that um, fearlessness is always going to be your your greatest ally in in performing. Um, I. I I don't know. Like uh, there's, there's some duality when you make a choice to do a role. And one, one part of the duality is, well, I really want to work and I'm just going to tell them I know how to do this thing, Mm -hmm. whether I believe it or not. But at the same time, the other side of that coin is like, I'm never going to do something that I don't stand by or believe I will find a way in to do. So it's like, it's not a lie, but there is a premeditative faith and fearlessness that walks into some of these roles. Some are so obvious and easy. I mean, like I, I it's not like I had to do research for uh, the movie late night. You know, I don't have to do mm-hmm. research to go in and goof off on a, on a show like Cobra Kai. But this is one of those things that I know I could have tried to talk myself out of, but I was like, no, no. I look enough like the guy. They need somebody. Um, this is really a good opportunity for me to stretch and prove that I can do dramatic acting. And I love Taryn and Dennis. I'm fans of their work, so let's do it. Uh, nice. And I'm glad I did. I'm glad I did. But uh, in the future, yeah, it's like there are certain things that come across my proverbial desk where I go, I don't. I don't know if that's me. I think they. I think I know why they want that to be me, but I don't think that's me. Mm-hmm. Um, and oftentimes, it's like a lot of projects I get sent or, or try. A lot of projects that try to lure me in. A lot of it's like they'll butter you up and they'll they'll compliment you to death. And it feels nice at first, and then you're like, "Well, I'm not that good. Why are they talking like this?" And then you realize. It, they're trying to add garlic to a bad meal. You're, you're an ingredient that they think mm-hmm. will somehow make the meal taste better. And it's like, Oh, I don't, I don't want to be a part of a bad meal. I don't, I never want, I Paul, the actor never want to get sent back to the kitchen. Mm-hmm. I love that. Well, Paul, thank you so much for talking to us. Thanks for hanging out for a bit. Uh, thank this you, was, man. This was yeah, of course. Uh, and again, uh, the performance itself, it really incredible. Uh, and we'll be Thanks. we will be watching to see what happens next so incredible thank yes, you yes sir thank you so much Vinny. have a good one thanks as always to our brilliant producer Jamie Muffet and to the whole team at Backstage Samantha Sherlock Mark Stinson Caitlin Watkins and of course Casey Howe visit Backstage.com and don't forget you can subscribe to Backstage with code ENVELOPE at checkout for a free trial 100% free you simply cannot beat that for more exclusive content find us on facebook and twitter at in the envelope and subscribe share and leave a comment who should we interview next to let us know thanks for tuning in we'll see you next time for another peek in the envelope